Kia ora koto. Uh, welcome everyone and thanks for joining this session on machine learning and applications to coastal morphodynamics. The reason why I got into machine learning is pretty clear. I wanted to spend my time like this and in the meanwhile I was hoping that the computer would not only produce results but also produce models. In fact, uh, machine learning is particularly interesting because it's concerned with computer codes, computer programs that automatically improve their performance. I really like this definition, it's an old one, 1978, uh, but Simone already at that time uh, realized the potential for this type of uh, computer programs. And he was a Nobel Prize in economics, not in computer science of mathematics. Certainly machine learning is growing as a field, is growing a lot also in the coastal area, but probably not so much as I was anticipating. Let's look a little bit more what machine learning is. Traditional modeling was based, is based on um, inputting into a, mo a computer data model and the model. A model usually process-based model where we describe all the processes uh, through mathematical equations uh, to represent physical processes usually. Data and model go inside the computer and we get an output, our prediction then we can use it to predict or to understand. But this is the traditional path to modeling. Machine learning turns it around. Now all data, all the input to the computer is data. The input data and the output data. So we have to provide the machine learning with the input data, the output, and the machine learning algorithm will give us a model. Then we need to assess obviously the model and see if we can use it for prediction. Why do we use machine learning? Uh, machine learning is not necessarily a tool, especially at this stage, I have to say that uh, is useful to understand about processes, but we don't always have to understand. Sometimes we only need to predict and machine learning are powerful predictors. Um, machine learning also allows for algorithms that self-adapt and this is used a lot, in a, there is a lot of applications uh, just think of Spotify self-adapting to the, to the users, but we can think of algorithms that have self-adapt to beaches, for example, and develop specific predictors, for example, for inundation or for erosion using machine learning that developed using data for that specific site. Machine learning is used a lot in data mining, probably not so much in our area, because we already know what the association between variable is, but it's certainly an area where machine learning is used a lot. And machine learning also can perform very complicated tasks. It's used to drive cars. So it's normal that in our field, it begins to be used for image analysis, for example, but a lot of other applications, I will argue, can be um, imagined. Uh, machine learning is also very accurate, tends to be very accurate, although the codes, um, are quite complicated, so there is a conflict between accurate and complicated. Why now? Well, at the moment, um, we are living the big data uh, era. We have a lot of data available. Journals now require to submit data, so more data is actually becoming available. We also are developing much better algorithms for machine learning, more powerful, uh, we have faster computers that always helps and there's a lot of industry support because they actually see the potential for this technique and here I just looked at the fields where machine learning is mostly used and actually noticed that our field is not mentioned in general physical sciences are not we do use machine learning but not a lot or not as much as we should so let me give you some examples of applications of machine learning. In this case, we tried uh, together with co-authors to predict uh, the suspended reference concentration. There are some uh, theoretical, although still heavily parameterized expression from Nielsen, from Lee, for example. Um, and we developed uh, using the same data set, a boost regression trees and an artificial neural network, which in both cases perform better than the theoretical uh, approaches. You can also visually see that they work actually better, although there's still a lot of scatter. Uh, of interest is also that um, 
since we used only a limited number of variables with orbital diameter, water depth, mean period, and grain size, uh, we can actually see, we can actually infer which parameter is more important when uh, describing, when developing the predictor using machine learning. So some insights sometimes can be extracted, although I acknowledge that is uh, very basic at the moment. Another example is uh, bed form geometry. We developed uh, a predictor of ripple spacing. Here is measured and here is predicted using genetic programming. Using the same data, then we compared uh, our predictor to others already existing uh, by Salisbury and White House, Pidocchi and Garcia. These are, um, in general, heavily parameterized formulas anyway. Uh, so at that it is almost normal that a fully uh, that an approach fully based on machine learning ends up per performing uh, significantly better. Another example that I think is interesting is the one of swash trying to predict swash, very important for coastal inundation uh, problems. We do use a formula to predict swash. We all use the Stockton et al. formulas. Others have been suggested, but I think this is still the, uh, the most popular one. It involves calculating the swash associated to incident waves and then to infragravity waves. The formula is actually quite simple, and this is the data used originally by Stockton et al. Again, we have measured the swash elevation and predicted swash elevation. Um, we then developed some genetic programming predictors. Here you can see the expressions. They're only slightly bit more complicated than the one from Stockton. More complicated also implies more parameters. Uh, but the formulas, they actually work better. In a minute I will show you also the statistics, but I think already visually you can see that the formulas tend to work better, although there is a flattening at some point for some data set in the prediction. Uh, we then applied those formulas and also Stockton to data sets from three beaches in New two in New Zealand and one in France. Uh, so on data that none of the, um, these equations had ever seen before. And I think visually we can already see that uh, there is a different type of spread around the one-to-one uh, -one line. So the genetic programming actually works better also on data sets that has never seen before. And I think this is one of the typical criticism from towards machine learning, but in this case, uh, it is actually not, not true. Um, here are the statistics, the measure, uh, the error metrics for, for the study and in terms of maximum error, any sort of measure of the error shows that both on the original data set and on these new data sets, uh, machine learning seems to be always working better and provide more accurate predictions. But overall, at this point, is the it? I'm providing example of the use of machine learning. And in all cases, what I'm telling you is that machine learning can provide very good fit to scatter data. That's essentially what these examples have discussed. Is there more to that? I think so. And I think we already see some advances um, in, our, in our field. And I think we should look also at other fields quite a bit because uh, there, there are a lot more possibilities. One of them is uh, what we tend to call hybrid modeling. Here you can see um, a bed form field. This is in meters, so these are 500 meters. These are very large bed forms developing in the inner shelf. And together with Evan Goldstein and co-authors, we developed a model that combines a description of the physical processes, uh, but some aspects of these physical processes are described through machine learning. For example, the development of wave generated ripples, small scale ones, uh, is done in this model using machine learning as a predictor. Uh, this is relatively new in our area, but is actually very common in other fields where there's um, a combination of process-based models with machine learning doing part of the job. Definitely an area where a lot more could be done. 
in terms of deep learning, this is probably a word that everyone has heard already. Uh, there is really a number of advances and Daniel Boscom is publishing a lot on different areas using deep learning. It's definitely an area where we can do a lot, a lot more. It seems like there's a lot of possible applications and these are very powerful codes um, with a little bit maybe the problem of overfitting, although we do now have techniques that deal also with the problem of overfitting, we will see it in a minute. Anyway, deep learning is certainly an area where um, it is easy to predict that there will be a lot more uh, applications. Then long short term memory. This is a not so recent technique anymore, but we still do not quite apply it in our, uh, in our field. Here is a little schematic of how it works and how neural networks are embedded and um, trained in a way such that they can also um, detect and then use for prediction patterns that occur uh, in, the, in the past. Uh, we use the, this technique to try to predict uh, over time uh, the evolution of the shoreline, which is in red with the measurements here in this figure, here you also see the wave height. And the prediction of the long short term memory is actually very good, although the green line, the long short term memory model prediction, uh, tends to not capture the fast scale of oscillations. Um, we then focus with another technique trying to capture those oscillations. Again, neural networks, uh, recurrent uh, use of convolutions, everything is in this code that is actually quite complicated and again time shoreline position wave height on the top panel and we can see that in this case the model actually is capable of predicting pretty accurately in some cases um, the presence the, the oscillations that we observe in shoreline position in some cases it can predict them but there is a bias that is clearly not capturing and in other cases, as we might expect, I mean, we don't expect uh, any predictor to have to be perfect for a problem like this, but um, it sometimes obviously also fails. Convolutions are also becoming more and more popular. Here, um, I can show you another application we're working on and uh, thinking of the Littmann and Dahlman classification scheme, we have a very large 20-year uh, data set from a beach in New Zealand and we developed the using convolution neural network convolutions um, <clears throat> a classification scheme that allows us to uh, train the code with a limited number of images and then um, the code itself is capable to classify with 90 percent accuracy uh, all the other all the other images uh, we notice that for example in the end of this beach there are a couple of states that are not present at DAC where Littmann and Dolman conducted their studies and then some states that actually do not seem to appear at Tyra Beach. So let's make a quick summary. Machine learning is definitely powerful. It's allowing us to do things that up to a couple of decades ago were just not possible. Um, the situation at the moment is actually quite the opposite. We just need to think of an application and if data, if good data exists, or can be collected, then almost inevitably we can come up with a machine learning uh, model that is extremely strong when making predictions. But machine learning is not only powerful, is very, very, very powerful, which means that the codes are also a lot of times quite complicated. Extracting knowledge from these codes is very difficult. They remain a great tool if we need to fit scatter data. Let's use uh, directly machine learning rather than those heavily parameterized formulas. That is my feeling and I think the direction where I want to take my research. We should always keep in mind that if you have rubbish data, machine learning will produce rubbish predictions. It's a completely data-driven uh, technique, methodology. So we need good data to produce good predictors. So, I keep on telling you that they're super good, uh, but I also keep on telling you that they're not extremely popular in our field, although the trend is definitely uh, in the growing direction. Why? Why is that? Um, well, one reason could be that 
um, I showed some extremely rich data sets that we have, but that's not always the case. Um, in a lot of cases, we actually, in our field, we still lack data. The situation is rapidly improving, and now we tend to put our data, um, we, we tend to make our data available, so more data will become available and hopefully more applications will, will be done. Um, there is also probably a bit of a distrust for predictive approaches that are purely inductive, entirely based on data without adding any process. Well, it's obvious that we enjoy, we like explaining why something happens. And so maybe there is a little bit of a distrust for machine learning for this reason. Maybe there is also a lot of distrust, deep distrust for black boxes approaches. Uh, it is true that extracting information is complicated. Um, it can be done for simple algorithms. It becomes very difficult for extremely convoluted and complicated um, codes. And maybe there's also uh, the general issue of overfitting that affects people and makes them wonder whether uh, machine learning should be used or whether it becomes uh, a predictor that tends to overfit. It's a typical criticism. A criticism that is not necessarily true because at this point it's a matter of uh, looking at the models produced by machine learning and study for overfitting. There are cross-validation techniques that are extremely powerful, so overfitting can be avoided while retaining a great predictability. Overall, my feeling is that um, maybe we are missing an opportunity or maybe we are, all, we are beginning to discover what machine learning can do. And so it's easy to predict that in the future, more and more studies of this type uh, will happen. Machine learning is not perfect. Um, it struggles. It still struggles to recognize uh, to, uh, the difference between a chihuahua and the blueberry muffins. So do not worry, we are still needed scientists maneuvering the machine learning um, approach. Is still, uh, a scientist is still needed. This remains a field that is growing super, very fast. I, I imagine in our uh, field, it will soon really shoot off, uh, also because more data is available. Um, I also want to stress the fact that, the fact that machine learning focuses on prediction uh, is probably criticized by many, but prediction is still science, and we, we do need accurate predictions, and machine learning can, provides that, can provide that. It is also very likely that in the future, machine learning studies will also focus on extracting more information from, from this algorithm. At the moment, I agree in many cases, they're a little bit of a black box, but I, I assume there is the possibility of entering inside and understanding a little bit more of what is happening. So my suggestion is to do more, um, find applications, find good data and apply machine learning, it seems to me like that's uh, the way forward. Before um, finishing this, this presentation, I want to acknowledge um, some of the people I, I still work with on machine learning, Evan Goldstein and Sina Masood, I'm sorry, uh, primarily. Uh, and then I also want to recognize uh, the whole team, the collective, and um, it's great working with all of them. I hope you found the this presentation of interest and I look forward to questions. Thank you very much for your attention.